Novamente conosco, o Andrew Binder. Esteve, esteve presente em 2019 falando em car hacking. Hoje ele vai falar sobre IoT na parte da agricultura. Andrew, obrigado mais uma vez pela participação e é com você. All righty. Hey, thanks for the warm welcome, Rafael. It's uh, always a pleasure to be here. Uh, okay, so welcome to the next talk, uh, IoT security in agriculture. Uh, did he just say agriculture? Yes. Uh, with agriculture, we have everything from food, animal husbandry, a new renewable resources, energy, basically anything that comes from outside, inside, to your table, to your mouth. Uh, it keeps you uh, warm and fed. That is technically within agriculture, could also mean uh, horticulture, things like that. A little bit about myself, uh, about my background. I am a senior mental security consultant of Red Team Services with Synergistic, uh, a small company based out of Texas in the United States. I've been in the technical field for whew, longer than I really care to mention, uh, but I am a U.S. Navy veteran. Um, I started out in cryptography and eventually worked my way into security of computer systems in uh, active and defensive roles. Um, and I uh, was co-author of uh, Hacking with Cali. Uh, a little bit on the screen here, you can see some of my previous talks and my certs as well. Now, why are we talking about agriculture? Agriculture is a $3.5 a trillion dollar industry. Yes, that only makes up about 4% of the uh, global GDP, uh, but when you take into account all of the uh, other businesses, the, the workers, the uh, supportive roles that go into agriculture actually makes up about 16% of the global GDP. So it's actually quite a big industry when you think about it. A lot of things that uh, you have in your normal daily life, you don't really think about where it comes from, how it gets to you, how it's actually grown or uh, transferred to you in some way, shape, or form. Uh, however, across the world, there's about 570 farms. Uh, now, those farms do range from everything from small little mom and pops uh, you know, growing maybe a, a few crops here and there, or supporting local farmers markets. But we do have also the larger farms that, uh, you know, grow produce and ship it all across the world. We do have a problem, however, and that is in agriculture, there is, uh, we are being outpaced by the number of people on this planet versus what we are growing on a yearly basis. Um, Unfortunately, this is uh, a hard truth to swallow, but um, this has been brought up across the world in different summits. Uh, scientists are very well aware that this is a problem uh, and uh, there are actions being set in motion to make sure that there is enough uh, food to feed our planet, uh, all 7.7 .7 and growing population that we have, or 7.7 .7 billion rather. Uh, in that process that we do have, though, agriculture is actually responsible for almost 10% of all greenhouse gases across the planet. So this also does make some interesting challenges on how we grow, what we grow, where we grow, uh, the land management process, um, how much uh, destruction we're actually causing to um, our agricultural lands and zones, uh, different gases. Um, and some companies have grown up to actually meet these demands and um, and capture things such as uh, methane from manure and things like that uh, to provide it back as a, as a resource for power. Um, in our local area where I currently live, our um, even our waste company that takes away our trash and things like that, uh, they power their entire fleet of vehicles off of uh the gases that come out of the trash piles and things like that so some really interesting things about agriculture just as an overall one of the other challenges that we also have is the cost of agriculture agriculture has its inherent processes that we must be going through we have everything from uh how much uh it costs to uh, how much we actually spend out per 
uh, different industry or different problem or different uh, process within the, uh, within the agricultural space. So on the, the chart here on the screen, you can see that uh, the market value of global food systems is about 10 trillion US dollars. This was, of course, in 2018, so it's probably a little bit higher than that. But when we take into account obesity, undernutrition, uh, pollution, greenhouse gas emissions, uh, our, our business overhead costs, uh, what it costs to actually transport it, get it there, um, and everything that we technically waste, um, all the food that gets thrown away so that there's still a loss, we actually have a deficit a deficit of almost $2 trillion. So again, this was in 2018, but at the same time, um, the cost of getting food uh, from the field to our plate, we're getting renewable resources, even solar or wind energy. Uh, eventually when it gets to our house, uh, we're still uh, spending out more than what it costs to have it. That said, uh, scientists are aware uh, there are things in place around the world that are uh, helping us get onto a better, uh, in, into a better path, a better rhythm. Um, and so there is a large movement in agriculture to reduce greenhouse gases, reduce overhead costs, increase the, uh, the food uh, availability uh, so we're not having um, uh, you know, people going out and going starving uh, so we can actually get food to plates. But future expense, uh, expectations of agriculture, we have a $5.7 trillion uh, increase in global GDP by 2030 and rising again by another $10.5 uh, trillion by 2050. So we have an emerging market here a need to actually uh, increase what we're doing so we can just thrive as a planet. But it's a, a, you know, it's quite a bit of expenditure. And then when we look at it from a business and marketing solution as well, there's also a, a projected increase just in the next uh, 10 years of $4.5 trillion. So, you know, we have everything at our fingertips. We have, every, we have a plan and we're getting there. Sort of. When I say sort of, it's that it's a plan. We're going to get there. We're going to be doing these things. We're not going, you know, people are not going away. Food consumption is not going away. Uh, electricity is not going away. So, uh, you know, we have a, a definite growing market that we need to pay attention to. Uh, one of these other things that they're really looking at capitalizing on is trying to reduce our air pollution by 80%. Um, how do we do all this? Well, it's through IoT. So IoT can help our technology needs um, through better land management processes. There was, at one point in time, uh, we didn't have proper land management. Uh, we would, uh, or I should say farmers would, actually end up uh, causing dust bowls because they weren't rotating their crops. There's bacteria in the ground, uh, overgrazing of animals and things like that. We have better conservation now, but how do we monitor it? Uh, there's new systems of growing food as well. Uh, vertical growing, if you have never seen these before, they're large, super large warehouses. So instead of just laying out across the ground uh, in the traditional fashion, uh, cities can actually provide more through growing lights and vertical pain systems of agricultural uh, you know, staples such as lettuces, tomatoes, and things like that. So less space, more food. It's great. Uh, we're also bringing the internet to rural areas. Well, if we're going to bring it out there, we're going to have the technology, we're going to use that technology. Um, if anyone has heard of the recent uh, you know, expansions by uh, Elon Musk or Starlink, the big satellite company that's uh, actually in beta right now. But that is one of their big goals. One of their, you know, they want to bring the internet to those who don't have it. And once they have it, what are they going to do with it? They're going to use it and we're going to use it for good. 
if we have the internet access, we're talking about faster data and better data analytics, which I will get to in a couple of slides later. But we want to be able to ultimately monitor our food growth, monitor our animal husbandry practices, monitor our lands, and we want to be able to respond. Renewable energy is already um, you know, pretty well set across the world, whether it's wind energy, solar energy, hydro energy, things of that nature. Uh, being able to feed that power back into the grid without burning coal, without burning wood, without creating uh, mass amounts of uh, air pollution and things like that. And then if we're using all this land, one of the things we do have to pay attention to is pesticide management. Uh, contamination of pesticides into the ground leak, leach into uh, underground wells uh, can cause different kinds of runoff to streams, lakes, rivers, oceans. Um, and these are practices that are hopefully going away, but they probably won't be there. I mean, they'll probably be there for, for you know, a bit more time. So uh, in the process of doing all this, IoT really allows us to focus on that data-driven life that we've all come to love and live. And so when we go through this process and we incorporate IoT and we get everything that we want, we get faster responses, better data analytics, and we can actually grow more uh, and do more with less effort. So first thing I gotta stop and say, let's talk about the farmers. So in the case of farmers, uh, the picture on the screen here is actually uh, American Gothic, the painting by Grant Wood. Um, and when we first think of farmers, this might actually be the most accurate picture that we can really get in our minds. Uh, you know, we've got the, we've got a, a farmer here and his daughter, and he's holding a pitchfork. Uh, you know, it's kind of solid. But at the same time, uh, that we don't really think of them as technology forward. We, we think of them living out in the country and doing everything on their sweat of their brow. Well, you would be absolutely wrong in a lot of cases because farmers have some of the coolest tech on the planet. Um, I really wish I was in front of a live audience for this so I could see the number of hands that go up and say, how many like to play with drones? Um, I'm pretty sure that everyone would say, yes, I want to play with one, or I've seen them and they're really cool, or I, you know, I have one. I actually, my person, I have a couple. Um, that, you know, they're a lot of fun. Uh, those drones are used in consistent, uh, consistently to monitor um, herds of animals and uh, uh, crop rotations, there's all different kinds of sensors and everything for them. And they always have to get that data back through some kind of gateway or get it back to, uh, you know, get it back to the farmer in some way. Uh, other things, tractors. We don't, we don't think about tractors. Everyone thinks about 1960s, you know, just heavy steel frame. But when we talk about incredibly large farms, you know, 600, 1,000 square acres or so, uh, <laughs> the combine tractors, uh, the, the, even the, the hay balers, uh, they're all computerized inside. Silo grains, uh, so after everything is cut from the ground and actually put into the silo storage, and once it's filled up and it's finally shipped off, uh, you know, go be processed, things like that. Uh, even those, they're temperature controlled, they're controlled remotely in a lot of cases. Uh, there's actually a bunch of really cool technology that goes into that. Um, so. We have to get away from the idea that the farmer is uh, just a, a person out in the middle of nowhere and doesn't really have access to technology. Now, in some cases, yes, in smaller farms, yes, this is probably very true, but uh, farmers are becoming more tech aware. Uh, they are, you know, if they can get access to the tech, they will use it. Um, and let me tell you, some of the stuff that they have is just a coolest stuff you ever want to play with. So welcome to the 21st century, right? Uh, so if it's out in the field, it needs to be monitored. Uh, whether it's hydration needs, pesticide, uh, fertilization, uh, if it's on workers, uh, what is it, what is the temperature? Uh, even 
even small farms, such as my own farm here, we have watering that is for the orchard and for our garden, and it is uh, controlled by our local weather. So it actually connects back to my house via Bluetooth and then goes out and makes the determination, uh, you know, hey, do I need to water today? Okay, well, it's sunny outside and it's, there's no chance of rain. So yes, let's go ahead and water. Oh, did I overwater? Did I underwater? How much do I go for? You know, based on the climate, it, it actually makes those decisions makes a lot easier on my wife and I just to be able to take care of even just our little hobby. Further. But when you're talking about, you know, hundreds of acres worth, or you're talking about, uh, you know, uh, large amounts of, of animals, uh, thousands of chickens, hundreds of, uh, of head of cattle, uh, you know, being able to monitor their health and their activity, uh, their feed consumption, things like that. Uh, all of those can be controlled by a device and help save us time, energy, personnel, um, and even in some cases, um, uh, help us prevent ourselves from getting into accidents or causing problems with our environment, making it worse for us. Now, this one gets really fun. Cool toys. Walmart. Yes, I said Walmart has smart bees. Well, I shouldn't say has smart bees. Uh, back in 2018, they filed a number of patents for uh, different agricultural tech. One of them being smart bees. Now, if anyone is from Walmart and is watching this, that picture that's there on the screen, I think it's just an artist representation. It was I just grabbed it from online just because the idea of smart bees to me is just absolutely insane. Uh, there's purists that are gonna say, hey, we need to just have more bees, we need to be better about our care, where Walmart is taking an active role in uh, in our IoT technology is saying, hey, we, we can match technology and nature together and we can work smarter together with our nature. Uh, as a matter of fact, Walmart, uh, Walmart Canada uh, just invested earlier this year uh, three and a half billion dollars into the automation of agricultural tech. Other companies like Barilla, we go to the store and we may be buying a box of pasta. I never once thought that Marilla would have launched an agricultural satellite network. They're, you know, they've got a, a, a specialty here in communications for field operations. But when you start unraveling what they actually have as a product and then reverting it to what its basic components are, of course you end up in agro. So, um, they actually have this uh, company for agro-satellite. Uh, IBM. IBM has artificial intelligence through the Watson platform. Uh, huge data analytics. Uh, if you don't know what Watson is, go play with it. It's fun. Uh, Precision Agriculture. This company, um, very interesting actually, but uh, so they have coined the phrase for their company of Precision Agriculture. But as we, when we talk about technology uh, and better standards within farming, uh, we actually use the term precision agriculture. So if you're willing to look at this company, fair warning, you might get a sidetracked a little bit. Mm -hmm. But they have advanced sensors and different types of telecommunications within their uh, or telematics within their, uh, their host of products. And just a couple of years ago, just about 80% of all agricultural machinery had some kind of core service that was offered by precision agriculture. That is uh, quite extensive when you think about all of the machinery that you would normally think going into a farm. Uh, trace genomics, trace genomics did soil genetics testing. Uh, when I first started this project, uh, I started looking into farm management for IoT. Uh, my wife actually came to me and said, hey, we need to do a soil test. I said, what? It's dirt. Why, why would we need that? And so we sent out the sample and we comes back and sure enough, we needed to treat the soil because there's no way that we could have grown what we wanted to grow in there. Um, and so it, it uh, helped us identify uh, issues so we can actually grow what we want better. And this is actually a, a really huge uh, thing within all of farming. 
is going out and actually testing that dirt, making sure that it's being treated properly. I'm going to skip over a few. John Deere. John Deere is the one, one of the standards in farm equipment. Uh, they are duly noted by all of the heavy green uh, with a little deer on it. But uh, when you think about the equipment and farmers using the equipment, the tractors and things like that, um, you don't really think about the technology that's in the background that they're using, that they're implementing within their, within their, uh, within their machinery. So they're responsible for uh, GPS guided um, combine tractors and things like that. So farmers can actually make sure that they're not missing anything. And in some cases, they can actually automate the whole entire process. Um, but GIS mapping or, uh, you know, making uh, custom maps uh, for areas to uh, help the, uh, the tractors with um, uh, pitch and tilt of the unit so it doesn't like fall over and roll down hills if they're, um, you know, not on necessarily flat land. Uh, tracking and seed management, uh, these are obviously really big. Uh, there's another company that was not on the list here, and that was Monsanto. Monsanto uh, got bought out by Bayer Corporation. Yes, the yeah, aspirin company. Uh, but uh, they do a lot of um, pesticide control. They do a lot of uh, a seed genetic modifications for better uh, their growing. But they also have tracking and um, uh, data analysis on what you're growing, how it's growing, things like that. Uh, so, I mean, there's, there's quite a bit that goes into it. I had to, absolutely had to save this last one here, and that's rent to kill rent to kill offers pest management solutions. Like, what, what does pest management have to do with anything with agriculture? Uh, in their case, they handle everything from home pests to pests way out on the farm. Uh, and they have ways, uh, different ways of tracking them and making sure that pesticides are being sprayed uh, correctly within these policies, guidelines for your area, uh, and things like that. So when we talk about pests, it's not one of those things we really think of, but it's one of those things we absolutely have to think of because of the chemicals involved. Now, speaking of pest control, I want you to ponder this for a half second. Oops. <clears throat> so we, as security professionals, are digital pest managers. Yes, I literally just called my job pest control. If you live in a city, if you live in a high-rise apartment, if you live in the suburbs, if you live on a really big farm, it doesn't matter. Everyone at some point in time has had to deal with pests, ranging in, uh, you know, from, from just little bugs to big fawn, the rats. Everyone has had to deal with pests at some point in time. Uh, now, if, you, if you've been a homeowner or you've been a property manager, you know that pests don't go away. Much like attackers or malicious actors that are out on the internet or with, even within companies sometimes, that is always a consistent threat that we have to think about. So in case of pest control, <laughs> we're talking about uh, malicious actors being our pests. Now, just like pest control, you can put up a really good defense and you can have a really good barrier and you can, you can keep control of your house or your property but you can't always keep them out. And they will always be there. And they will always be outside of your network or your perimeter, but they're always there. So if we are digital pest control, the, uh, digital pest managers, if you will, blue teams uh, are, you know, they're going to actively monitor your networks, your devices, things like that, um, for unwanted pests. Uh, and uh, in that case, that makes uh, red team, uh, you know, who actively hunt and eradicate those pests for you, or eradicate holes rather in your networks so the pests can't get inside. 
Now, your IT, your internal security, your CISO, they formulate uh, ideas and work together for preventative maintenance. I just thought this was a nice little twist on the whole agricultural piece as we, as we go through this process uh, to try to explain the different pieces of uh, you know the roles that are actively involved in security around uh, around the IoT devices. Before we get into the actual IoT security, let's take a half second and put our thinking caps on. Uh, threat model, the big what if. Anyone who's ever worked in the security industry uh, may have been involved in doing threat modeling at some point in time, and threat modeling uh, comes from questioning. And we come from a place of saying, what if this happens? Uh, how does this happen? Uh, what can we do about this? But before we go down this road, <laughs> let's keep in mind, this portion of my talk is not aimed at uncovering or exposing or even instigating any type of conspiracy theory. Uh, these are just what-if scenarios to help understand the larger security issues that are there. So go ahead and let your mind wander for a half second, but keep in mind that every IoT solution or agricultural implementation has its own challenges, uh, its own threat models. Uh, overall, there's gonna be some commonalities that we can explore, and that's what these kind of questions on the screen here are designed for. So what if crops are under or overwatered? Well, let's take a look at that from a realistic point of view. If a major producer of, let's say, wheat has crops and he thinks that uh, based on his IoT sensors that he's getting enough water, his sprinklers won't kick on or he won't go click them on. Um, so he's not paying attention. Well, what happens when all that starts to die down? When all of that goes, when he or when all that goes away, and he comes out to take a look for the harvest, maybe he's only at a quarter of what he's actually expected to grow. That means that's a. I mean, that's his livelihood. That's his family that he has to think about. But let, let's take that even further. If he cannot get all the crop that he's expected, the company that's onboarding all of his wheat will now be short. If there's a shortage in the market, we go down further line, the consumer us, we end up having to be stuck with a higher food bill, or we can't actually get what we want. We have food shortages in this case, and that's just one, one product. What if we overuse pesticides or fertilizer? Okay, well, let's examine fertilizer. Fertilizer, when you actually put it on the ground, can, uh, it actually heats up the soil as it decomposes and breaks down. If you put out too much fertilizer, it will scorch the earth. So you can destroy crops. Um, you can make land, in some cases, unusable. And again, we repeat that same process of not having enough down the supply line. What if rain silos stop functioning? Okay, well, we had a good harvest, and we put it away, and we're stocking it away until it actually goes out for transport. But those silos, a lot of them now are literally controlled. They have humidity sensors, uh, they have um, uh, active rotations that, that, that keep them uh, moving, keep air through it. And the reason for that is not just to store it and keep it uh, you know, uh, free of bacteria and things like that, is that farmers need those silos uh, to make sure that their crops are held at a, a really high quality. Um, there are some silos that can actually measure out and say, okay, this is how much you have. This is where it's at in humidity. Bingo, it is time to sell. You will get top dollar for what you're, what you're actually sending off to have it, you know, turned into cereals and things like that. Uh, so when we stop any silo, if it's full, you could end up 
destroying what's in that time. So all that work cannot be redone until the next year. So again, we have a food shortage. What if winter here is not functioning? If you want a frightening experience, go Google image this one. Uh, in the case of uh, wind turbines, uh, if the gears use up, it can cause overheating. It can actually cause them to explode. A lot of these happen to be out in fields, uh, fields that may not be maintained because there's nothing out there. Uh, so if there's a fire, before someone can actively respond and get there, you may end up scorching or having a, a blazing fire. Now, now, firefighters have to put out hundreds of acres worth of, of burning active fires. Uh, what if uh, the health of livestock is adversely affected? Um, I have, even just on my little farm here, I have automatic waterers. What happens if I'm away and on vacation and I expect that active water to take care of my horses? Well, I could possibly cause my horse to die. That's just my little farm here if there's a malfunction. And granted, I'm going to have a backup and things like that, just as you know, most farmers should. But at the same time, when it comes to larger, much larger uh, farms for like dairy and things like that, they have ways of monitoring the health of, say, the cow who's actually producing the milk. Uh, making sure that they're not injuring the animal in any way uh, so they can get the most uh, milk production out of the animal. So they could end up again with a shortage or end up even harming the animal, making it an even greater shortage. Uh, what if solar charged batteries overheat? Most solar charged batteries in solar panels are lithium. I if I was in the middle of an audience, I would ask you, take out your phone. Do you know what is in the common battery in a phone? They're lithium. Uh, you may have seen or may have heard or even experienced what happens if those batteries overheat. And those are just small batteries in your pocket. Um, people have been seriously burned. Uh, they just started uh, building fires, things like that. But when you're talking about much larger solar contained you know, our solar uh, energized batteries, um, you know, having those overheat can cause significant problems. And then once it actually does explode, you're also talking about uh, potential um, uh, chemical interaction with the environment as well. Uh, and that cleanup can be uh, quite costly, uh, can also cause lots of problems for the environment as well. Now, the last one here is, uh, what if there's an attack on the water supply? Okay, I don't really need to go in depth on this one. This has been portrayed in movies and TV over and over and over and over again, where the villain actually wants to go out and uh, poison the water supply and things like that. Okay, well, uh, you know, that they always make that out to be really big in, in, the, uh, in movies, but. Uh, at the same point in time, when we do take a look at water treatment facilities or the runoff of uh, chemicals into lakes, rivers, ponds, uh, underground water, et cetera, uh, there is a significant risk there uh, if water supply is damaged in some way, shape, or form. And it can take years uh, to clean up, even in some cases, if it's really bad decades. So if an attacker was to say take over the uh, the the services affecting or maintaining some type of water treatment facility. Well, that could actually spell some really bad uh, things because almost everywhere, especially here in the United States, our water has to be treated. And the water is treated with chlorine and other chemicals in large doses would be really bad. Uh, especially things like fluoride and chlorine. But um, in smaller scale, uh, it could mean runoff and, and damaging, and it could also have a much larger impact to the surrounding ecosystem, to uh, fish and rivers, lakes, things like that, um, and all of the, uh, the little other microorganisms that are there or the animals that are in the area. So uh, we'll get away from the threat modeling, but this gives us some kind of understanding as to why we need to protect these things. But 
in the case of trying to protect these things, IoT in particular has very unique challenges. Unlike networks and web applications and mobile applications, once they're out and about, the attack surfaces become very complex. One of the reasons I got into IoT was because I got bored. I got bored just trying to do penetration testing for networks or just for web applications and keeping that as my, my kind of day-to-day -day job. When we look at IoT, you have integration with cloud services, you have physical devices, you have sensors, you have all different kinds of protocols. Uh, you have integration to web applications and other different technologies, automated backends, you have mobile applications, wireless, anything that you can think of, we found a way to automate it. And if there's a device attached to it, it's more than just the device. You have to really think about the ecosystem overall. So in that case, we don't just attack one thing, we can actually get into IoT via a much larger attack service. When it comes to the devices and themselves, the sensors, uh, or the, you know, the physical implementation of the gateways and things like that, uh, they're harder to monitor. Most IoT devices, they might have a watchdog service that actually runs on it and if it detects a problem or detects you know, files have been manipulated or something, uh, it'll reboot itself. It, you know, it'll try to kick out whatever is there. But that service is really inefficient. Because no one else is actually on that device, they don't, they don't get picked up uh, very well. Malicious activity that might be coming from the device. Uh, a lot of our vulnerability management processes, they go out with the scanners and they, uh, you know, they scan, they see, okay, that port's closed, that port's open, that port's closed, that port's open. Um, but unless there's an identified problem with that device in particular, it'll skip right over. In a lot of cases, if a malicious actor gets into a network, they generally try to hide themselves within IoT devices because of this inherent problem. That is so hard to monitor. There have been a few uh, vendors that uh, claim that they're able to monitor these devices through behavioral analytics on the network and things like that. But when they come to IoT and agriculture, those aren't necessarily on networks that you can monitor, or they may be out in a field, an oil service, uh, or a herd of animals, or uh, wind turbines, solar uh, batteries. Uh, you know, just a sensor out in the field measuring the ground. Uh, those may be on a wireless uh, system or a mesh network of some kind uh, or long range wireless uh, or monitored even halfway around the world. You can't tell if someone's gone out and tampered with it and what's, what it's actually doing. It's much harder to be able to do that. So if they are compromised, it is even harder to determine if it was and how it was compromised. If a white hat hacker, a security professional, a tester says, hey, there's a problem, you have a vulnerability. That vulnerability can actually be a very costly implementation to fix or re remediate. In the case of remediation, you know, if you rush to get a packet or a package out to fix that hole, what you end up with could end up breaking the entire system. So there's a delay between identification of the vulnerabilities and the actual rollout of the security patch. If you have data protection or compliance issues, um, or requirements rather, uh, those can also be uh, a hindrance in how your device operates on your network. Especially um, we have GDPR, uh, we have uh, IoT sensors that collect user data and things like that. Uh, we do have to have compliance on how do we handle that, how do we mitigate it, how do we uh, make sure that there's uh, no access to it, et cetera. Uh, you know, once it's also out in the field, 
somebody buys it, somebody takes it, uh, I mean, by take it, I mean they steal it, uh, you have knockoffs. If somebody sees your design and they try to build something that looks like yours, uh, or a competitor builds a very similar device, uh, you know, th these are another set of challenges uh, because your device, you want it secure, they just want to make a sale. They may integrate with your product in some way, shape, or form, and now you know your your clients, uh, your users. They think that they're using your product, but they're really not. And then we have the supply chain management. Uh, this one is actually kind of interesting when you take a look at it in a long term study, uh, because let's, let's say even chip manufacturers, you can order chips from say Samsung. They're Samsung branded, they've got the label on it, they've got a serial number on it. But do you know where they came from, which factory they came from, uh, what their security practices are, etc.? So that's something you also have to take into consideration is while those devices are getting built, where's all your stuff coming from? Where are your components actually originating from? And has anyone tampered with them since they left the factory? Um, this can actually cause issues with products failing to launch on time uh, all the way through uh, backwards. Um, but I digress. When we talk about the actual security of the devices, we may roll into other situations, uh, you know, center around security, but one person that always pops up is going to be IoT botnets. On the screen here, there's, oh, about 30 or so, uh, different botnets. Uh, some of these are very much active and still in the field. Uh, the Mirai uh, and Qbot, which is the, uh, let's call it bigger brother of uh, Mirai. It's been reconfigured. It is still, that one is still very active. Mirai got shut down, but this, you know, this botnet keeps getting resold and reconfigured and resold and reconfigured. Um, and it does some really nasty things. Ultimately, there's going to be two common cases with IoT botnets. In the case of botnets, they go out and they try to scan across the internet for devices. And once they get in, then they do bad things. And that's generally mining, uh, you know, they turn them into uh, Bitcoin miners or they hold data at ransom or they're, they're looking for sensitive information on other systems that may contain like credit card information or personal information of some kind. But those are the two main attack paths. Or excuse me, the two main attack paths are going A through uh, an exploit, a known exploit in hardware, or B, weak and guessable passwords. If uh, you've been paying attention to the news, just within the last couple of months, there was uh, Fritz Frog and Lemon Deck. Both of these services are botnets that went out and actively uh, combed through AWS, uh, Google, Microsoft Azure, uh, through those larger networks. And they would sit there and they would just guess all day long for username and password. Uh, these botnets in particular weren't targeting IoT so much as just a blanket targeting everything in their path because SSH is the most common way of managing remote devices and remote services. Uh, I did wanna highlight that Ripple 20 is actually not a botnet. Ripple 20 uh, came out earlier this year. It's a series of 19 different vulnerabilities that are estimated uh, as actively exploitable on millions of devices worldwide. So when we take into account all of the other uh, all of the other uh, different botnets that we have here on the screen, a lot of these simply go out and exploit uh, known vulnerabilities and gain access to a device and then start the master's evil bidding, if you will. So if you have not read over Ripple 20, it's really important that you or your developers actually go out and do it over it. Is a lot of these will likely in the future be reconfigured to use uh, what is what was discovered and disclosed in uh, Ripple 20. 
Not all of them, though, are, uh, I shouldn't say that they're not all nefarious, but uh, I would also like to call attention to Brickerbot. The Brickerbot network, uh, botnet is, uh, it actually has no financial motivation. Uh, none at all. Um, it doesn't install crypto miners. It doesn't uh, try to actively uh, pull data. It doesn't try to exploit the network other than to brick the device, just as its name is called. Uh, and by bricking, I mean that the device is shut down or in some cases completely destroyed. It, it will, it's more of a destructive bot. Uh, the creator of this one is, uh, he, he wanted to actually show that this is a, a, a thing that can be done. So in the case of IoT, we also have to take a look beyond what those traditional botnets do and where they go and how they attack devices. IoT sensors in agriculture are going to be out in the field, not necessarily attached to a network. But what do the sensors actually do? They generally transmit data back to a gateway or back to an originating source or even communicate with each other uh, through wireless protocols. And in those cases, those wireless protocols, if you're out in the field, may be the only way of preventing or uh, gaining access uh, to a device. If we were to stop and actually look at the number of different wireless protocols that are available, your minds would probably be blown. It's uh, definitely, I'm, I could probably name close to two dozen, but I won't bore you with that. Uh, we traditionally think of wireless as just being uh, 802.11, you know, extension of, of uh, LAN networks, you know, so, but it's much more than that. When we talk about Bluetooth and 2G, 3G, 4G, even 5G, those are pretty standard as well, doing cellular communication, things like that. But uh, we have uh, LoRa uh, or long range uh, RF. Uh, some use um, you know, basically the same as your normal uh, car's key fob operating uh, in the 400, uh, 443 megahertz network range, I think it is. Um, and they use a series of on-off key. So in those particular attacks, somebody could go out and actually record signals that are being transmitted and potentially just replay them. They can jam the signal. Uh, there's other different types, uh, like uh, rolling attacks. Rolling attack, in this case, being that uh, if usually if it sends an authentication key or uh, a, a sequence of numbers beforehand, it's it's kind of a an intermediary, let's call it, uh, security feature. It doesn't necessarily encrypt the data that's going across. It just makes sure that uh, the originating source and the receiver actually uh, knows that they're you know they're 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 good to talk to each other. Um, in, in a lot of cases, it, you know, it may not uh, it may not actually roll through the consecutive numbers or make a full random number. Uh, and those numbers are guessable, and they can be tampered with. And then a signal can be generated with faulty information on the other side. Uh, physical tampering again, it's held in the field. Who's monitoring this? We don't necessarily have cameras out in every farm, every field, all the time, everywhere. So physical tampering is one of the things that I absolutely love about IoT testing. I love getting my hands dirty and actually playing with the chipset and pulling and firmware and things like that. Uh, in the case of uh, physical security of those devices, unless they're locked down to a point where they cannot be theftable or they're so large that you know, someone can't take it off uh, of the, the site where it was originally installed, um, there's not much you can really do to get them to keep them out. Uh, tamper seals are available and it will let you know if somebody has opened it. This is really common at things like gas stations. Um, if you roll up, you might see the little sticker over the, the cover plate, uh, or there's a, a little log right next to it that you know says, Hey, I'm the manager, and I, I, I guess I opened this on such and such a date. Uh, but there's ways to make the detection that somebody has actually opened the device and taken a look at it. Um, if it's just a sensor, it's just usually they're pretty small and theftable. So I could walk out into a field, I could just 
disconnected from its power source and it, it's gone. But what does that sensor actually have on it? That sensor itself is generally configured with all the wireless settings for it to communicate back to the receiver or to the gateway. Um, a lot of devices uh, are, in this case, considered consumables. Uh, if they're thrown away, no one really thinks anything of it. So you just go put out more and that, that's it. When they get, some of them get auto configured, some of them have to be configured by hand. But what about the data that's actually already on that device? In this case, those broken devices that we throw away or they get stolen uh, may contain the information for the actual networking portion of the devices of, of, the, of the ecosystem that the IoT uh, solution is actually protecting. Um, in some of the larger uh, devices that are more uh, resource intensive, not just sensors, uh, you can find uh, firmware of uh, the company that actually made it, or make it wrong. Uh, you can look for, you, know, you can do all the bug testing and everything off the network. So our, all the bug hunting will not be detected and you can come in with a zero day. Uh, so there's, there's other paths that you can take that are outside of the network. As I said before in one of my previous slides, IoT security is complex because that field is so much broader than just the traditional network that we have. Now that we've got some idea of how IoT and agriculture have kind of merged in this growing market that we expect over the next uh, 10 and 30 years, um, how do we actually protect this? Well, this is good news because there's a lot of things that we're already doing in our normal security hygiene that will allow us to have a good, strong foundation. So if we're doing regular security testing, in the case of security testing, I'm talking about vulnerability management and penetration testing. Uh, vulnerability management being available scanners from the larger companies to go out and just scan the devices. Uh, that's great, but it only responds when we know that there is a problem. Uh, penetration testing is actively hunting for different ways or different bugs flaws in the system that are exploitable and then helps developers actually fix issues before they go out the door or while they're in the field. But when they make a security patch update, they can constantly be testing that. Um, as we go through this, we have to find some way to monitor these devices. Uh, that's actually a really big pain point at the moment, but it is becoming more available. When we think of monitoring, one of the first things that comes to our brain is the data. Well, we can tell the sensor is online or, and it's recording data, or we can say, uh, well, that device hasn't been in X amount of days or X amount of time, uh, so therefore we need to go and check it. Uh, in this case, what I mean is from a security perspective of, we actually need to be more proactive about how we are monitoring the data that comes out. Because let's be honest, if someone steals something that is small and theftable or out in the field and they can put it on a truck and drive away, there is actually very little that you can do unless you have locked down the compound and got six foot fences. And I'm sure the folks I tell you is if somebody wants to steal something, somebody will actively make an attempt to steal something. When it comes to the data, what happens if there's a, uh, you know, we get infected by a botnet or someone has broken into the system or somebody's transmitting faulty data, we need to be able to alert on those triggers. Uh, we have our normal physical security. We can go out and we can take a look. We can go out and we can uh, make sure that those, those devices, when we put them into environments, uh, that they make them as hard as possible to steal. I mean, not as hard as possible, but within reasonably hard enough uh, environments to steal. Uh, so that, that also helps protect the device and the data going across if someone can't get to it. Right? Hardening strategies. An IoT device is no different than a server, computer, laptop, web application, API. 
all of those have their own individual hardening practices. Um, if you are to take a look at any of the hardening guides that are available uh, from any of the different foundations or um, uh, there's even bloggers that have really amazing write-ups. Those hardening practices that we currently use in our day-to-day -day business operations can still be applied while maintaining usability for the farmers. So it's really important that we harden them while maintaining that usability. All of this all together allows us to take a holistic approach to security. In the case of a holistic approach, we need not just think about what's good for us as developers, what's good for our company and our brand. We need to think about what's good for the end user. We need to think about how this product is developed from day one all the way through its sunset process and all of the different factors that come in and out. We need to make sure that we're doing those threat models because those help expose potentially hidden attack services that we didn't know. When you practice proper hygiene and you think about more than just the individual device, you have a greater shot at successful security. Now, when it comes to uh, guidance on how to do testing, how to secure them, how to uh, stay within compliance, uh, NIST and OWASP definitely one number one, number two, top of my list. In this particular case, uh, NIST is, uh, uh, you know, they're, they're used to the 800 uh, series, uh, 800, yeah, yeah, the 853 series. Um, there's a whole bunch of you pretty much Google and then it always come up to the, for the computer standards. But uh, there's different use cases in each one of those and those provide a really great foundational look at uh, planning security. There's also using uh, different benchmarks, they, those from like CIS, OWASP, uh, the Open Web Application uh, Security Project. Uh, that particular foundation has what are considered the top 10 uh, for mobile applications, for web applications, for API, for code. Uh, they maintain a lot and it's a community driven uh, foundation. So, you're not just getting a very narrow view on what to protect and how to protect. You have a plethora of resources from a community that spans the entire globe on how to protect the device, why it's necessary, but even further so, how to actively test for them. Uh, also, one of the uh, really nice foundations that I have kind of been a part of uh, is IoT Security Foundation. So they are actually based out of the UK, uh, but they have actively developed guidelines that start all the way from development to introduction and security patching on how to uh, implement proper security within your IoT implementation. And those are not just geared for agriculture in specific, they're for all IoT all across the globe. All right, and that brings us to the conclusion of this particular talk. Thank you very much for your time and attention today. Um, I have plenty of time available for questions and I'm, I'm happy to field anything. Otherwise, uh, you can reach me out on uh, LinkedIn. I'm uh, always happy to talk about uh, such a subject that I am uh, incredibly passionate about. Uh, but uh, if you have any questions, please let me hear them.